Well, hello, and it is so great to be back in a KCC gathering. It's been too long, and it's something I miss greatly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The title you have for my paper is a quotation from Peter that I heard a long ago. Uh, I can take that on board. I'm going to return to that in just a couple of minutes. But what I want to do first is I want to say a few words about connections. Uh, and to do that, I want to include connecting with some voices that are not here with us. My colleague, uh, Barnett Pierce, who uh, certainly would rather be here. And uh, from KCC, uh, going through notes for classes, came across a nice compendium in my work on two pages, which I could never achieve, by a Penny Lewis, who was an important teacher and with whom I worked and was a very important person to many of us. Uh, Gianfranco Chiquin, a frequent visitor. Uh, those voices are still here, they're here with us. Let me first say a few things about starting places. Trying to put this together a bit, I was thinking there's a love story and there's a friendship story that are crucial. And the love story is, of course, uh, older than my acquaintance with them, but it's a love story of a young, ambitious priest who was more interested in counseling and a social worker that he married. And uh, that story goes on, which is a beautiful thing. And I can't tell you how many hours at the Lang's table the three of us spent talking about everything on God's earth, from therapy to religion to politics to everything else. It was my home away from home, and I treasure those moments. And of course, the friendship that's lasted that long. Peter and Martin, who got together and started concocting this KCC thing. And I know Martin's going to have more to say about that. It's also a story about courage. And I was reminded of that when I was reading uh, for the second time around the editorial page and Peter Stratton's bound to two volumes dedicated to KCC. And I don't know if Peter, oh, there you are over there. And I think four, four of you. Uh, co-wrote that <laughs> editorial, and uh, it fa was fascinating to go back to it for this reason, <clears throat> because it speaks to us the story of courage right away, that when Peter and Martin were first doing this, and Susan as part of this, the idea that emotion is a social construction, that we should think in terms of systems, that we should think in terms of language, not as strictly message sending about what goes on in here, but that language is constitutive. For all of us working back in the 1980s before, that was revolutionary stuff. And there were a bunch of us, both uh, in my academic community in Massachusetts, and I know in the uh, therapy community here in the UK, it was not the most welcome idea that was around. And we were all considered kind of crazy to entertain these ideas. And it's so nice now that some of my colleagues still think I'm a little weird, but not crazy, which is, a nice, which is really a very, very, very nice change. I'm going to, on that same note about the importance of language and creating a relationship inside language. Uh, I'll refer back to Peter's frog poem in a few minutes. Because we each have a frog story. My frog story is one that I've taken from uh, an American cartoonist, Walt Kelly. And the, car the little poem is very short. It goes, the little frog was colored pink. What does a pinky froggy think? I'll tell you what the froggy thunk. He thunk, Now, while that's funny, 
It makes such a vital point for all of us. Sorry, I'm walking away from this and I shouldn't do it. It makes a vital point for all of us that when we say language isn't just the means we have of spitting out something that's in here, but language is what creates an us as well as a me, that's still really radical stuff for a number of people. And of course, the corollary poem that I learned from Peter, all of my students know one thing, if nothing else, from my coursework. They know the Peter Lang frog in the garden story. Everybody know it? Yeah. It's just sort of like prisons where they, all the prisoners know all the jokes, so they just call them by number, and someone says, 32, and they all laugh. A new prisoner stands up and says, 16, and there's no laughter. And what went wrong? Well, some can tell, some of us can't. And that's an important theme here. Because a lot of what I want to say about what I've learned from Peter is in addition to, but beyond, the language. That there is a spirit and an aesthetic to working with KCC people. And it was so easy for me to see the difference because I'd get off a plane, get very jet lag. Susan and Peter and Martin, they learn fast do not schedule me to do anything on the day I arrive. Just out of kindness toward the people who might have to hear it. But that, sort of, I, that sort of early idea, invited in, and tell me if I get your poem wrong, that little bit about the optimist in the garden, I'm sure you've heard that, meets the pessimist, and swallowing the frog and all of that. It's not only changed the, the behavior, but you have to change the story. If my students know nothing else, they know the Peter Lang frog story. And again, well, it's funny. Look at what that story does. Look at what that does in terms of the usual way people still go around trying to solve problems. That is to decide who's good, who's bad, how do we fix it, what information do we need, instead of understanding that sometimes you've got to change not only the behavior, but if you change the story, it transforms the nature of behavior, because that's what communication is all about. Now that kind of orientation is an important one, and to move it forward, Susan and Peter and Martin had to have a lot of courage. I will tell you my one courage experience early on in my association with the, the big three. <laughs> At the time, Peter was driving a motorcycle. And I'm sorry, but I gotta tell the truth, Peter. <laughs> he drove with what would be a, a nice word, with a freedom and abandon. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on the back of the motorcycle. <laughs> And about 10 minutes into this, I just said, okay, this is my last day on earth, so I'm just going to enjoy it. But clearly, we're not. that's all I can have. Until we came by a sign, I don't know if the company is still in business here, but there's a beer company. And they have a huge sign on the road, on the road that we passed by. And as I was thinking, well, what should I think about for the last, these last now six minutes that I'm likely to live? And there comes a big sign that says, take courage. <laughs> well, that's for me. And that's how we all have to live this stuff, and still do in various things. Another kind of starting point, though, in addition to language, is just plain the hard work that I knew the big three put in. When I first started uh, my association with KCC, there was no KCC. Met uh, Peter at a conference in Calgary run by Peter, by uh, uh, Carl Tom, who got interested in the strange loops material and then insisted during a break that I had to get to know Peter and God was he right. Now one of the things that's going, that's going on with this uh, having to have a courageous point of view, is that I got invited to participate in what I still think 
is the most convoluted case that I've ever heard of in my life. And that was, I won't do the details of it, but there was a father who was a school teacher who always spoke in the language of an old time British schoolmaster, uh, or unless he was telling his daughter what to do, and then he would start to sound like a priest, which he wasn't. But when she told her about religious matters, he never sounded like a priest, he sounded like a schoolmaster. When he talked to her about school, he sounded like a priest. And that's just the beginning. And it was the best introduction I could ever have had. We had four teams, I believe, working on that single case. But what I got out of that was the notion of immersion. Rather than just starting to say, well, I don't know exactly how to get at this, Maybe I'll go think about it. We all got engaged. And for me, and that was about 1982 or 3, that was a revelation. And I appreciate it to this day. Well, now I want to come back to, oh, I want to that inclusionary story or statement of Peter's. I can, I can take that on board. I think it was a little later, and we were around the kitchen table at Susan and Peter's house. And I was telling Peter about a problem I was having with a student who had had too many psychology courses and would only talk in a sort of quasi-Freudian vocabulary, all about egos and ego strain and personality, which isn't quite Freud, but it's still in that traditional plot. I was saying to Peter, I don't know what I can do to ever move this guy along. And Peter said, ideas like ego and transference, I don't work that way, but I can take them on board. I don't have to directly say, you're wrong. I can get them into a conversation in which the grammar of ego is so changed that the student can live without the word that instead of that, to connect. And that was an important thing for me, particularly in my role as a, as a teacher. So I was a pretty darn traditional teacher back in the 70s and beginning of the 80s. Uh, to borrow a phrase from John Schotter, who once said, hey, I'm a professor, I lecture. <laughs> well, I realized I was lecturing much too much, including probably this lecture. Let me say, some other things about the, this notion of context and taking on board. The way ideas flow here is fantastic. And here's an interesting con con uh, contrast. As I read a good deal of the systemic therapy world, both in the States and here and probably other places, there is a dividing up into bits of turf. So in my university, there is a whole department that's split off from uh, sociology. They are the Department of Social Work. They teach solution-focused therapy, period. And they tell their students, if they say the wrong thing, that's not SF. And you better be SF. I made the mistake of applying to the department and saying, maybe you'd like me to do a guest lecture. No way. <laughs> because you're systemic. We're solution focused. And over in the business school, there is some really weird guy who does appreciative inquiry, whatever that is. But this marking off of terrain is not a very good thing. And one of the great things that I learned about KCC before you stop, you say, no, that's not the way to do it. Listen and make connections and see if there's some profitable ways to take that on board, that idea on board and transform it. Now that was a major kind of a major kind of event for me in my life. Um, making connections takes a lot of interesting forms, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it means immediately, when I talk to certain colleagues, 
That phrase of Peter's runs through my head. I can take that on board. I won't use the name, but at a conference a couple of years ago, I was trying to do a CMM systemic approach to people having an argument, not in a home, not over relationships, but people trying to decide policies and disagreeing with one another. And to think through, how are there some better ways to make this process work? In other words, to make, in the fullest sense of the word, make argument work that is not argumentative. I said that at a conference, and a very well-known person stood up immediately and said, arguments never get us anywhere. We don't speak about arguments here. <laughs> but, oh, here we go again. But that's not a KCC view, is it? KCC can play with its own ideas. New ideas have come into KCC. Uh, some things that were done at KCC when I first knew Peter and Susan and Martin aren't done so much any longer because people move and change and aren't wedded to these very narrow boundaries. And that's a very important thing to know because it tells you you can read something, not too much, Peter, but you can read a, a few things that aren't in a systems journal as long as you come back to a systems journal. But that was an important starting place for me too. Uh, and a very powerful context for a lot of us. Now, another important context for CMM, sorry, I'm going to CMM and KCC taking things on board has to do with a bit that's in an article that uh, Peter and Martin and I did, I think it was 1990, the Domains paper and particularly the aesthetic domain. And at the very end, I'll tell you a little more about what we're doing with that kind of focus um, right now. I want to say something else about this context of inclusion and taking on board. Some of the funny stories that have emerged from our work together. How many of you were ever at a conference over the summer, it was the Summer Institute at St. Stephen's. Are there any other St. Stephen's veterans? I know there are a few. It was not luxurious living, but they were very nice to us. We're taking a coffee break or a tea break, depending on the country you're from, and we're in a long line, and I'm at the end of the line with an Italian colleague, uh, Valeria Ugazio. We're at the end of the line, and, at the, and the food that was left, three digestive biscuits. <laughs> now they're just Valeria, myself, and this very sweet and very helpful little nun from, from uh, St. Stephen. <laughs> Program's supposed to go, we're hoping to get through the line. There are three of us left, there are three digestives on a little plate. And she goes up to the, those. I mean, let's face it, I hope I'm not insulting English sensibilities here, but I don't find different digestive biscuits dramatically different. <laughs> it's more like, how's the edge and where do you put the dots? But they're identical in size, and there are just three of them, and the only difference is dots around them. So yeah, we're trying to get back. And finally, she realizes that there are people behind her. And she turns back to Valeria and to, and to me and says, oh, I'm so sorry, but there's so much temptation here. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, that's funny. It says something. It's probably why I remember it. What options are you open to and what options are available? Here there are three options, but one's ability to work with them may atrophy after a certain number of years without making vital choices like what digestive are you going to have. But that's part of the KCC openness of learning to see differences when at first glance there aren't any and to be open to just taking a chance on the biscuit closest at hand and to see where you can go with it. Now, these events, well, they're funny. 
They take us back to ideas. They certainly do for me. That little event takes me to very important ideas, just as does the frog story. So let me turn now to something a little closer to what I was supposed to be doing here with you today. And that was to talk about what difference Peter Lang's work has made in my life. And I can't separate some things. The couple of things that I've authored with Peter uh, that are appear in Family Process. Susan's also the co-author on one of those. Martin's a co-author on another one of those. I can't tell you where one starts and the other stops. And that's the joy of working with these people. Always has been for me, I'm sure it is, for all of you who've worked with them. Now, if jokes and funny moments, like holding our way to the Oxford, any other Oxford workshop veterans, because I think there was one that wasn't at St. Stephen's. At any rate, the Cherwell River is beautiful, and we all got our heads on straight about Wittgenstein by, I think Martin bought the bottle of wine, I'm not sure who did. Quite often. <laughs> we put four punks together, and we sent apologies to those of you who were paying customers and got sent. They want to see Oxford. Send them away to Oxford and we'll do two hours and just talk Wittgenstein and pull our way down that Sherwell River. It's one of the best learning moments to remember. Will I ever see that in the States? Nah. First Amherst doesn't have much of a river. We have a little duck pond, but it's not quite <laughs> the same thing. But the fun we had in this, at that, was superseded in some ways by the fact that when we finished that little trip, I had a far better grasp on what Wittgenstein was talking about than I had ever had before. And it led to a piece that Peter and I co-authored about uh, uh, language and therapy. Now I talk about the aesthetic domain it's not just jokes, of course. It's the collaboration. It's the way one idea can follow another. The way Peter is so much a role model for doing that. Because when you work with him, he's always thinking. You look at a case, and I look over at Peter, and I kind of got the idea, what's that look that tells me something brilliant's about to happen, and I have no idea what it's going to be. But that sort of ambience that's created, and I'm happy it's being recreated with friends of KCC now. That's part of the meaning. The old view is there's aesthetics over there, and then there's hard-nosed language over here, and then there's behavior somewhere else. And we all know, practically speaking, that can't work. And we're all committed to the idea that can't work. But getting into reflecting on the aesthetic dimensions of KCC, whoop, it's important. In that domains paper, one of the things that said about uh, aesthetics had to do with harmony and harmonizing. And that's a lot of what happens. People bringing their own cases, their own ideas and training into this setting, and things get transformed and harmonized, and that's beautiful. And that's part of the meaning of doing work at KCC. Well, I want to talk a little bit about, because I'm ordered to, how has KCC made a difference in my life? Well, obviously, as I told you, I became a different kind of teacher. I do much less of this stand-up and hope you can endure me for 20 minutes or so. And a lot more, a lot more work with students in groups. It was a crucial notion was I, learned, I can't remember who articulated it, if it was Martin or Peter or Susan, and said, you can't teach something using a method that's contrary to exactly what you want people to learn. Like giving a lecture on participatory education, <laughs> which is kind of what I'm doing now, isn't it? But at least you can be a little self-conscious of it and not do it all the time. 
Now that was a very crucial, and so I said, I became a completely different kind of teacher because of KCC. The use of group work, doing case analyses, uh, watching the way students worked with supervisors. That was enlightening to me in the most profound ways I can say. Uh, quick example. Some years ago, I was trying to advise a student. I was teaching an introductory level course, and this poor student is a mass lecture course. There isn't too much you can do systemically when you've got 325 students, all about 18 years old, in rows with chairs nailed down. First exam, tell them, anybody who doesn't have a B or better, you got to come see me. Well, this kid who got, I think it was a low D, comes to see me. And I asked him, how did you prepare for the class? The student says, the way my mother taught me, I took each fact that you gave, or any quotation, and I put each one on a flip chart card, and then I shuffled them, and I turned them over to see if I, the meaning of that is. And of course, even then, the exams I was giving were not straight factuals. Oh, how does this connect to that? How do you see what's similar between this and that? And so he did terribly on the exam. And I'm looking at this kid in my saying, oh my god, you, you don't study for, that's not how you study for a university exam. But here's the voice of mama, who got him through high school, a single parent, very little money, did pretty well on his SAT, that's our entrance exam tests, uh, good high school grade point, and now he's failing classes or doing badly. <laughs> And the first thing I thought was my first inclination was, how do I get Mama's voice out of his head? But then I have Peter Lang's voice in my head saying, take it on board and make connections. Because if you disqualify Mama, you're in worse trouble than you were before. And so is this kid. So I started doing something new. I had to tell him, your mother gave you really sound advice to get you started on a factual basis for what you need to know. She's just done wonders for you. Now we need to see how we can build on mama's good ideas. They had a pretty decent, decent session. Got it up to a B. Not bad. But it changed my way of advising as well as my way of teaching. And that was extremely, extremely important. Now I want to say a few words about two things. First, what did working with KCC do to CMM? And in a sense, the answer is everything. But once I learned some circular methods and caught some of the spirit that Peter, Martin, Susan brought to this curriculum, once I had that, case of CMM was transformed forever, It'd be very quick. We used to talk about a hierarchy of beliefs. We learned about stories at, C, you know, at KCC. More than that, learning uh, how circular questions can fit with CMM and thereby change it. And in that fine volume, um, Peter, Susan, and I did a number on how do you integrate these things. In classes, We've talked about moral operators for a long time. But I only thought about a moral operator as having something to do with what one overtly does. Do I shout? Do I listen? Do I what? And several students in that class all said, we use that idea of the moral operators to apply to perceptions and understandings and what should or should, or should not be the desired goal. Of course, it all interconnects. It's all part of a moral order. That's just one example of the kind of change and enrichment that came about from working in a KCC kind of environment. Now I'm going to say, because I'm out of time, a few things very briefly about aesthetics. This is where my latest research has been going. 
John Dewey has a marvelous book called Artist's Experience, and why I like it is he says the first thing you got to do is get rid of the notion that there's art over here and there's everyday experience over there. There is an aesthetic dimension to every moment of life. How do you interview about that? Because part of what makes it an aesthetic dimension is it doesn't have a clear set of language labels. There are a few terms, but it's not like emotion where language is part of the very constitution of what the emotion is. How do you interview about that? And there are some ways to do it. And I'll leave you only with one last KCC bit, because what got me onto the aesthetics idea. I don't, I wonder, because I can't remember who it was, a young clinician, I think, wore the first case. Couple wanted a divorce. And he asked all the usual questions. Questions about, uh, that had to do with finances, about the kids, about what you do together when one comes home. And all he got, that this poor guy, I'm glad it's not me, all he got were superlatives. He is a wonderful husband. He is great with the kids. His moral values are absolutely impeccable. He's a terrific provider and a great role model for the kids. And on and on and on. And I turned to him and said, oh, she's a wonderful wife. She's a very responsible professional. She is a terrific mother. She is supportive of me in every way I could ever want. And on and on and on. And like the poor clinician, we're wondering, what the hell are you doing here? But at the end of each of these little runs of superlatives came, but I think we should get a divorce. <laughs> so we take a break. We're behind the one-way class, and they're not in there. And we're looking at each other. And somebody got this idea, which I liked because I'm in communication land. If the verbal side of things, that focus doesn't help, why not focus on what's left? We were still using tape in those days. Play the tape back. Then Peter got the idea, don't play it at regular speed. Play it fast and turn the voice off. And then you saw the most pathetic dance you have ever imagined. I don't know if it's coming back in the States. Ballroom dancing, you teach, take your 13, 14, 15 year old to one of these, and you gotta prepare them, and they're all, it's all about, where do I put my hand, and where do I put my foot, and am I too, I can't, can I touch him there? That's what it looked like. Look at the ugliest dance you've ever seen. Arm goes behind the spouse's uh, shoulders, falls off the chair. One goes to take the other's hand, and the hand moves away. Nothing was when we said, go back in there. Every question from now on has to be an aesthetic question. When was the last time you had a deeply moving moment? What's the most beautiful thing in your experience? Shocker was, they said, let's think about that. That told us this is a good line. And that's what we've been working on right till the last paper that I finished about a week ago. And without KCC, there'd be no such paper. Thank you.